Good evening, mate. How'd you like that wee intro, eh? I, I love it. Apart from that photo, Amy, I don't know what I'm thinking about looking at the book and looking over. Tremendous. I know, that, that's a hat. Where do you to, find that thing, man? Dearie me. That's a hat <laughs> off to her, Andy. Andy, who does all her, 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 her media stuff and her pictures and her TikTok and all that. The guy's brilliant, man. Um, Fair play. But anyway, welcome to another episode of My Celtic Story. Tonight, I'm joined by Paul John Dykes for your Celtic State of Mind and Axum. And another wee addition, absolutely delighted to have Paul John on. As a as an interview, guys, so apologies if I'm not on the comments all night. We'll have a wee 10 minutes at the end if there's any any questions. Paul said half, half air. Now, now's your chance to fire any bullets if, if he's fancy it. Go for it. Um, welcome, mate. How's, how's things, first of all, mate? Really good. I'm delighted you've asked us on because... Um... Obviously, you've helped us out quite a few times on the, the charity weekender deal, which you know we, we put out that call. People come together uh, to raise money for charities, so we've always enjoyed that. Um, just keeping busy, you know, just try to keep busy and putting things out every day on a Celtic state of mind. Um, we're, we're going live, we're going out in the road in 2023, so looking forward to seeing people, you know, the whites of their eyes, deal because you get to know the, the characters in the comments. I love that, and right. a lot of them are coming with the shows so it'd be great to actually meet them and get a catch up with them because there's a wee community built up over the over the period you know i know and uh, it's right <laughs> there's dan tell me not to swear already i know i'll try my best mate um as mate you see these people in the comments i'm only on twice a week but you feel as if you know them personally i know it's um, great I, I, and by the way you you look at the avatar you see the name but you know you, to actually meet them shake their hand and, and enjoy a night of Celtic entertainment. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and I bet you most people are nothing like what they're like on the comments and on social media, Dale. You know what I mean? Oh, definitely. Definitely, mate. We've got, we've got a few on every week. In, in fact, they're, they're on yours as well. I think most of the guys that are on mine listen to yours as well. So, for, first of all, mate, before we get into the Celtic story, we touched a wee bit in the podcast, which is absolutely fine at the moment. Um more awards last year for a, for a Celtic state of mind. Um, if you want to touch on that a wee bit, um, over 20,000 subscribers now on YouTube. And I mean, it's absolutely fine. The content's, the content's daily and it's just growing and growing, mate. Well, it's, it's something that I absolutely love. It's kind of like my baby. And uh, last year with the, the award, what actually happened with that is on the way down to Manchester, I'm looking at the the other people in the category deal. And I say to my missus, I say, listen, let's just enjoy the night out because we're not winning this. You know, <laughs> it's like a, one of the Champions League groups of death. I was like, <laughs> people had a million subscribers and all that. I said, let's go down and just enjoy the night, which we did. Um, but to be, you know, announced as the winner was tremendous. It's video content. So I love I love right. that. We've got like ideas of, you know, small documentaries and, you know, just, just wee things like before we came on, we're talking about some ex-players and that. And I had the, the real pleasure of getting to know Frank McGarvey a wee bit because Axom sponsored his team. So he's got this old boys team and it was all the ex-Celts with other people that, that came together to play games to raise money for food banks. And they would play all over the place and we sponsored the jerseys. Uh, so eventually I was allowed to play. Now I used to play very, very loosely, Del. I wore a jersey, I was on the park, um, and we got, got to know each other pretty well. So obviously his passing was just absolutely horrible and shocking. Um, is. you know, and it's just it's one of the things like it would be great to get all the guys together, maybe individually, and just get their memories of Frank, put it together as a wee video. That's the kind of stuff I like doing, you know, wee tributes and stuff like that. Aye, aye, definitely, mate. Other other than the the, the acts and stuff, um, the new book came out, the Celtic jersey. I have I have purchased it. Um, haven't haven't fully went through it all, but I've had a wee scanner over it at the festive mate, and such so, such a different type of Celtic book, totally it's... different type mate. And reading through where the jerseys actually came from, the, yeah. the manufacturers, and any kind of wee story behind it. And I did watch one of your pods the other week when you went through the the old Umbro with the Umbro stuff, and you had a good chat about it, but. Seems to be flying, mate. Was talking to chaps, and so oh. so far what I've read, it's it's very very interesting. Well, I appreciate yourself and everybody else that, that actually bought it. It was one of the ones I had this brainwave. Um, I remember I was in um, 
this is me going back to a previous book I was working on. It came up on that video there. I was over in Spain with Andy Lynch, Dale, because, you know, he's got a place out there. And when we were working on the book, it was like over the phone. And then we'd maybe meet up for an hour. It was going to take forever to get the book yeah. finished. He wrote a biography and I was ghostwriting it for him. And he says, why don't you just come over for a couple of weeks and we'll get sat down every day and get through this. And I mean, you're not going to say no, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> when I was over there, he had this tremendous jersey on his wall that he wore in the 77 Cup final, you know, the match one. And I love the match one stuff because Neely Mockin, uh, whose book I had written before, um, his son inherited the collection, which is it's thought to be the biggest Celtic collection in the world. And I was able to look through that and I just remember thinking, we need to capture this. This is just unbelievable. So it started off almost like a hobby. Um, and w- with every book I've ever worked on, I've never had a publisher. So whenever I do something, it's a labour of love deal. And if a publisher comes along, which they have, I've been lucky enough that they have come along, then that's great. But it's just, it's almost like a wee project until the publisher gets involved and then it's, right, here's your deadlines and all that. Um, but I mean, I, I met some great people, people who collect jerseys, their knowledge is unbelievable. They can look at a label and say, right, that jersey was worn in 1973 because the label is different. My knowledge isn't like that. You know, I just remember, like most fans, who wore the jerseys, what cups we, we won wearing them. Um, and there's some cracking shirts that you've not got good memories of because, you know, like Neil Lennon's last season, the jerseys, right. were, the jerseys were superb, but I've got no good memories of us wearing them, which is unfortunate. But it took me seven years to get that book out, so I was delighted when it finally arrived. It's a long, long time to get a book out, but I, if any, I'll, I'll put most of the guys obviously listening to myself, listening to you, so you'll, you'll know where to get it. Um, some TV stuff as well. You're, you're becoming a bit, of, bit of a celebrity, Mister Dykes, on the, the, the Sky Sports and that as well. You're a, a very, very busy man. How's the, how's been the kind of facey Celtic, if you want to put it that way, with, with the Sky Sports stuff and that been for you as well? Do you enjoyed it? I, I do enjoy it, Dale. Um, obviously, it came with a wee bit of flack, which maybe naively I, I wasn't expecting it, but that happened, which is fine. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. Um, but some of it's been like tremendous. I mean, going on off the ball the other week and actually uh, seeing how the whole thing works. And I'm like I'm like a bear in a sweetie shop. I'm just sitting there thinking, this is brilliant. Because I love Stuart Cosgrove. Um, he, he's an unbelievable uh, brain when it comes to Scottish football. But his musical knowledge as well. I mean, I've got old NMEs in the house, and Stuart Cosgrove's um, a writer for the NME back in the 1980s, and he's now the voice, one of the voices of Scottish football, and he's just like a, an encyclopedia of football and music. So I, I do enjoy it. I've got to say, um, I took a wee step back because obviously the social media thing got a bit heated at times. So I took a wee step back for a while, uh, but I've been doing a wee bit again, and I do quite enjoy it. Uh, that's that's what I had a wee note, obviously. This, I've, I've took a wee step back for the social media as well. I'm having a wee, a dry January off off the drink and the socials as well. But there's there's so much good and so much praise and, and people liking what you're doing. And then you get this this small the small element of, of arsehole, don't you? It's it's impossible to avoid. Is that something now that you've been in the game kind of that long that you can kind of bat off or? Does it still affect you a wee bit? It, it's, it, it does. It does with me sometimes. Know that I don't lose any sleep over it, but sometimes you're, you're looking at these comments and you kind of sit and maybe ponder too long. And, and some of these people that don't really deserve to be pondered upon, if you know what I mean. It's really strange. It's really strange because I do sometimes get concerned about how it affects some people, Dale, because we've had a couple of um, targets on Axon. And I get a bit concerned about that because I feel a wee bit of responsibility because I've asked them to be on the show and then they get flack for being on it. Um, I think initially there's there's a bit of shock because everything I ever did was pretty uncontroversial and nobody really had any kind of heated debates about it. And then all of a sudden the, the floodgates opened. Um, I, I think you'd be lying if you said it doesn't affect you, but you, you learn how to deal with it a wee bit, Del. And I'm always of the view that if... if the people that are giving you flack were to meet you, speak to you, they probably have a completely different view of you. And, yeah, you know, and I, I listen to a lot, especially when I'm on my commute into the studio, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Very, very few of them are football related. I, I listen to a lot of, you know, long form interviews and stuff like that. 
Um, and there's some really good ones. And I was listening to uh, Stephen Fry on the Diary of a CEO. And and he summed it up really, really well. He said, you know, it used to be like you could go for this wee dip in a beautiful wee river, but now you're standing on bits of broken glass every now and again. And it's a wee bit like that, Twitter. Uh, it's unfortunate. But um, I'll certainly not be driven off it. That's for sure. Ah, definitely, mate. That's the right mindset to have in regards to it. Um, so other than that, before we get to the Celtic, there's you've got a lot of live shows and, and music stuff coming up with Celtic State of Mind as well. Um, in 2023, if you want to touch on that a wee bit, and then we'll we'll get torn into the Celtic, mate. Aye, definitely. I, well, what happened just before the lockdown, I was, I was doing quite a lot of the live events, and I really enjoyed them. Um, most of them were Celtic-related, Del, because... You know, I'd kind of got to know uh, John Hartson and that a wee bit, and they do a lot of live events. Um, and I was really enjoying that, and it was taking you up and down the country. And before you knew it, I had uh, been offered to go over to Australia, Spain, and all that. And things took a turn for the worse, obviously. Everybody knows what happened. And that's why we started live streaming, because at that point, a Celtic State of Mind was just a, it was just a weekly audio podcast there was none of the stream. I didn't even know what StreamYard was, if I'm going to be honest with you. Right. Um, and then we were all kind of stuck um, indoors. I thought to myself, no, we just need to engage. We really need to engage. And once you get over that um, kind of like nervousness of actually appearing physically on a TV screen and going out live and all that, because at first you're, you're a wee bit anxious about that. Uh, once you get over that, you, you, tend, you tend to forget it because you get lost in the conversation and bringing the uh, comments and that up, you know. So I'm really looking forward to it. We've got uh, Martin O'Neill in February, which is just going to be brilliant, and uh, Brian McClare in a couple of weeks. So I do a lot of preparation, and what I tend to find, Dale, right, is I'll have sheets and sheets of paper with loads of questions, but once you sit down, it, it just kind of takes a natural kind of turn, uh, and you does. just let it, you let it run, you know, and it's really enjoyable. There's a few surprises um, for these ones. There's... There's various things that's going to get the, the audience involved. So if you're coming along to the gig, be prepared. <laughs> Good stuff, mate. Good stuff. Right. My Celtic story with Mr. Dyke. So let's get right back to the start, mate, before even even your first game. And e even just a wee bit about where you grew up and, and your family, and how you actually became a Celtic fan. I know we always say you're, you're born in one, but mm. how, how did it actually come about with the, with the family and stuff? Well, I'm, I'm from the villages in Fife, if anybody knows the West Fife villages. It's basically a, a wee pocket of mining villages, small communities, Dale, uh, working class. And, you know, it's cliched, but you, you can remember nothing but Celtic. So all your uncles, your, your old fella, your cousins, everybody's Celtic fans. And what that, that actually comes from my mum's side, because I, I'm interested in the history. I remember my old, my old nan died, my old granny died. And she left this big folder, and it was the family history on her side, on my mum's side. And I just found that really, really intriguing. I've never done any digging on my dad's side. Maybe I, I shouldn't. Maybe I should just leave that. But um, my, old, my, my old dear, she's she's for Donna Goldstock, Maguire. Um, and they came over to Fife via Hamilton. And it was just pit work. Everybody in my family are just mine workers, you know. I was a um, same, Aye. And so, you know, Celtic... Growing up, it's all you ever knew. And I always, I always go back to these memories. I was living in a wee place called Oakley, uh, one of the villages. And, you know, my old man working shifts all week. And at the weekend, it would be, um, it, wouldn't, it wasn't actually a supporter's bus as such. It would maybe be like a wee paint van, a wee minivan or something. We'd come uh -huh. up on the street. We, we lived in a place called Stanley Terrace. It's like the highest part. And it would come up the street. And it would be my uncles, my cousins, and the old But it was just the excitement in the living room, Dale, knowing Aye. that your old fella was going through to Glasgow, which, by the way, you know, that, that seemed like a different planet when you were <laughs> living in the, the villages in, in Fife. Um, going to Glasgow to watch Celtic. And then the day would last forever for him to come back. And then the version of your old man that came back was a slightly different version, a slightly inebriated version. Uh, and he'd, he'd have the Celtic scarf and the programme and... It was just the excitement of eventually being able to go yourself. And at the time, I couldn't really understand it, but I do now, because when you start going with your mates, Dale, and you go to the boozers and you go through in the supporters' buses, I get all that now. But at the time, I just wanted to go. So I probably wanted to go from, let's say, 83, 84. I was right. really, really aware from 85, 86. I remember the Scottish Cup final, 1985, where McGarvey scores the winner, Frank. Yeah. 
Um, and the old fella came home and he lost a shoe. So he came home, he was only wearing one Adidas Samba. Right? <laughs> we, never, we never ever got to the bottom of that one. But yeah, I liked the wee swelly. He still wears, thankfully. Um, but it wasn't until 87 that I finally was taken along and it was like, I was just hooked. I was kind of hooked already, you know, with the idea of going. But then uh, when I went and I actually experienced it, the colours and, you know, the smells and everything that went with it, it was just, you know, I've been intoxicated by it ever since. Well, can you can you remember your first game? I do, I do. I've actually, I've got the programme just through there. And this is interesting because my, old, my, my older brother's 11 months older than me. Um, there's four years, two, two sisters and a brother. And we both went to this game and he can't remember being at the game. And at, the, at Christmas there, I went to see my old dear and my uncle, Chip, who's my godfather, it was him that took us. So the circumstances around that were, um, as I say, my old man was a, a pit man, went through the minor strike. It was something that kind of galvanised you, politicised you, all these different things at a very, very young age. And then after that, um, we moved. We actually moved from Fife and we moved through to Midlothian. He got a job at Bilston Glen and it shot within about 18 months. And then after that, he basically worked abroad, uh, mainly in uh, Denmark and France. But whilst he was away, I was coming of age in terms of what really wanted to go to the games deal. You know, I was at that age. By the time I went, uh, I was eight and it was uh, the Tommy Burns testimonial, 1987 against Liverpool. I've always had a, a bit of an affinity with Liverpool as well. I love Liverpool um, as a city. The fact that all the you know the music that came out of there, the art that came out of there, and at that time, of course, Kennedy Wish was a player manager, Celtic, mm -hmm. absolute Celtic legend. So we got taken along to that game, and I remember being in the Celtic end. They beat us one 0 Ronnie Whelan scored the goal. I remember it in my mind's eye right now. I can picture the goal, and then after the game, uh, Tommy Burns came back onto the park, and what had happened is Danny McGrain had left in the pre-season, got a free transfer, went to Hamilton Ackies. But he never ever got a chance, Dale, to actually say goodbye to the Celtic fans. So Tommy got him on the park and he went round and, you know, Celtic fans are throwing the scarves and all that on. And as I say, I was talking to my old uncle who took me. Uh, he took me and my brother Jamie to the game. And uh, he's got a really good memory. And he, he went everywhere. My dad went everywhere as well, other than that five-year period where he was kind of working abroad. Um, but that was my first game. And as I say, it totally hooked me. You know, it was, it was one of the things I was just thinking, right, I need to get a season ticket. Even then, I want to go to every game. Uh, yeah. I didn't get a season ticket till 94, but when my old fella come back, I think the last place he worked in was maybe Denmark, he comes back and we start going to the games on the, the local village buses together. But unfortunately, we were absolutely rank rotten by that stage. So we did the centenary double, which was just phenomenal. Loved that. And then the Scottish Cup the following year, and then nothing. So we started going in the middle of the nothingness of the 1990s, yeah. early, was early the 90s. Yeah. That was exactly the same, mate. Tough, tough, tough times. Tough times. The supporters buses is 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 one of the things that I always it's it's very much at the forefront of my mind. As as much as going to watch Celtic, um I used to go in the, the railway tavern bus for, for Motherwell, which has been running for, for decades now. And their buses made you grow up quickly mm -hmm. and probably probably young eyes seen some stuff that you you weren't meant to see back in totally. the days, but what, what, what was your memories of the supporters' buses? And oh, obviously, a wee bit nearly a, nearly a journey for you. We were only 15 minutes to paradise, but I take it it was a kind of 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock start, and the, the old was, dad on the, on, the, on the cans of tenants and that. He was, aye, he was. As I said, he probably didn't take me from, let's say, 84, 85 through 87 because. He was having too much fun there. We went to all the games, home and away, European, right. the works. He actually also followed Scotland, which I find weird because I never really inherited that love in international football. Um, he used to go to all the Scotland games as well. But um, supporters buses were an education, honestly, right. see, for a young guy. And I remember like some of the village villages ones that they don't actually run now, but people who are from the village and from Fife will know the names. So when we went on the Oakley bus, it was a guy called Ding. <laughs> That's all I know him as Ding. He's still alive, and he, he used to drive the bus. And uh, guys that went on that bus, who were probably I'm trying to think of the kind of what ages they were. Tell I mean, one of them he got called the Reverend, right? <laughs> uh, he got called the Reverend. He actually passed away really, really young, and it was really sad. Um, Jay Cusick, 
who was probably in his 20s and he was like, you know, he would get on the bus and tell you what had been going on on a Friday night and all this stuff. And for a young boy, I'm just lapping all this up. The bad right. language, obviously, everybody's smoking and getting bevied, the whole works. <laughs> and you're just sitting there, just soaking it all up because you're just a bairn, really. Um, and I remember, it was home and away uh, on that bus. And I remember uh, going to Tyne Castle, for example, um, and walking down the street, and my old man just knew everybody. Pit men are like that, Dale, you know? Uh, it's like, oh, yeah. there's there's Jimmy Dykes and all this. And we ended up standing on street corners, and he's drinking El Dorado and all that. And I'm thinking, da, I want to go and get a programme. I want to go and see the game. And as I say, that was in the height of us being absolutely rank rotten. And I, I remember we got pumped 3-1 that day. Um, but Tommy Coyne had scored, I think it was equaliser. And by the time, Tommy, I love Tommy Coyne. Great by point. the time they beat us, um, that was one of the days that we had started singing Always Look on the Bright Side, you know, Monty Python, just laughing at ourselves. Um, and then after the Oakley bus, I got on a, a wee bus in, from a village uh, in Blair Hall. And again, my dad must have been working away, I can't remember. He wasn't on the bus, but I was there, right? And I went, I went for the Hamden season. And it was right. run by oh, and it was run by a guy called Jockey Munyon, who was a cousin of my mum. Everybody in the villages is related, by the way, Dale. Just need to paint that picture, right? <laughs> so so he was it's a very small gene pool, like you know. Um Jockey ran the bus, but he kind of looked looked after me because I was related to him, kind of distant relation. Uh, but Jockey had been to both European Cup finals in 67 and 70. And again, it was a, a much calmer experience, Jockey's bus. You know, there wasn't any smoking and drinking and a bit of foul language, but that was about it. Um, and eventually, I ended up going on the Arthur McKenna for a bit in Log Alley, the Log Alley bus. Um, but by that time, I was at that age, so I was going with my mates, and we were having a bevy and all that as well. Um, so you can see the, the kind of like transition from child to adult through the Celtic buses and going to the games. And then after that, I started going myself, to be fair, and I was driving after that. Um, and that that's still the case now. When I go to the games, I tend to just drive through now, Dale. You know, I, I don't I don't have the whole drinking. I've done it. You know, I'm I'm 44 now. I've kind of done it. Um, I'm trying to get my wee boy into it, so I just need to behave. I'm the same. I, I drive. I, I've been driving in there for about five or six years now. I've got the wee man a season ticket, and my other wee man's on the on the waiting list. But I still like to have a wee. I still like to dip my toe into the supporters' van, especially derby games or, or or Euro games under under the lights. I like to go for my wee um, my wee bottle of red wine, shall we call it, and uh, a bit of patter with the boys. But I don't think that will ever leave you. I don't think it'll ever leave you. I know guys on the buses in their fifties and sixties, and you would think they were they were twenty year old, but. They go it's again. Part, it's part of it. Exactly. It's part of the kind of culture of going to the games. And um I, I'm I'm a big advocate of selling drink in the games. And I think in my lifetime that's got to come back. It's just a draconian um rule. 43 years we've not been able to drink. And what it does is it makes people like kind Take of binge drink. Aye, of course it does. Know, binge drinking and you know, if you could go in there and, and drink responsibly, then I think it would work. And obviously, I think there's steps towards that with things like some of the concourses being opened up recently, Dale, uh, getting the, the licences. Because, listen, if you're going to have a bevy, you'll have a bevy on the way through anyway. But, um, you know, sometimes I think that they've got to start treating football fans like other, you know, people in society. If you go to a concert at Hamden Park, you can have a drink. If you go to a rugby game at Murrayfield, you can have a drink. If you go to a game yeah. at Celtic Park, you can't drink. What, what they try to say that we're a different class, we, we can't be trusted by alcohol. Needs sorted. It does. It definitely does, mate. So going away back to the 80s and 90s then, uh, if you can name one, or, or I would imagine there'll probably be a few, but early early heroes, early heroes <laughs> of yours. I've got a funny story, Dale, right? Um, Paul McStay is the obvious one, right? The guy was an absolute Aye. genius, yeah. right? And... Uh, you know, it's, it pains me to say it, but there was probably a point where he probably should have left Celtic uh, to, uh -huh. to fulfil his potential because he was with a really poor team for a, a big section of his career at Celtic. Picked up a lot of injuries. Pick, you know, he carried the team for seasons on end. But uh, the funny story is um, when I was younger, it probably stayed with me to, to this day. I was a bit of an anorak when it came to Celtic, right? So I would write to players and all that deal. I still got all the replies, right? I would do all uh -huh. that kind of stuff. And uh, we signed... 
listen, this is 87 88, so forgive me for this one. Anybody that's watching, <laughs> we signed a striker who was very, very prolific. He was a young guy, he was top goal scorer in the centenary season, which was like the dream season. And that uh, guy's name is Andy Walker. I know, so, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so I wrote a wee letter, and I was like, Oh, Andy, favorite player, and all this. But it was really, really funny, right? Because my family knew what I'd written in the letter. But a few weeks later, and I, I think I posted it on Twitter for anybody that, that could search. It is on there. I've got an image yet. This beautiful card came through, Del. It's the kind of like um, frame that you would get in a communion card, right? So it was brown with the gold trim and all that. You opened it up, and on the right-hand side, there's that picture of Andy and that beautiful centenary strip. And on the left-hand side, he signed it with a gold marker. It just looked beautiful, right? I was delighted with that. And again, it gave me the, the bug for it. So I started writing to everybody after that, obviously, right? But it was years and years later. They were doing a, there was a brilliant program. I think it was on STV. That was the team that was. And what they did is they went back to a specific season and they spoke to every ex-player from the team. And they actually focused on the centenary season, right? And um, Andy Walker was getting interviewed. And he was like, uh, oh, I remember the first bit of fan mail I got. And we're all sitting watching it, me, my brother, my dad, and we all were all kind of thinking, nah, surely not. Can it be Paul? <laughs> Can it be this letter? But I remember writing it, we had a laugh at the time. And Andy says, Oh, and you know, Andy, oh, you're my favorite player, blah, blah, blah. He says, Can you get me Paul McStay's autograph? It was me that wrote that letter, right? So I've told that, but I was trying to get I'd already written to McStay and he hadn't replied to me. So I wrote to Andy Walker and asked for Paul McStay's autograph. So years later. I was talking to Andy Walker uh, for the documentary that, that we made a few years back, and I told him that story. He could remember it, Dale. You know, he was laughing like any. He's like, I can't believe that was you. I, it was me. I wrote to Andy and asked for Paul McStay's autograph. But I eventually got McStay's autograph. His wife sent me the letter as well. Anne-Marie sent me a handwritten letter. But that's the kind of anorak I was, mate. I got stuck into all the books, all the fanzines, all the VHS videos, and I used to write to all the players. I was a proper saddle. I write anorak. That's good, but that's that's good. See, just touching on Andy, and I, I know why you started the conversation off the way you started it off, because he's kind of, and what what a fitter player the guy was, absolutely phenomenal striker. But I mean, he's, he's, he's I wouldn't I, I would say hated is quite a strong word to to talk about the guy, but he's very very disliked with the Celtic fans, as are as are quite a lot with former players that were really good players, icons, heroes mm. that move into the media kind of stuff. I think Mr Commons has kind of disappeared off the face of the earth, but what, why do you think that is with, with, with proper Celtic men? And you look you look at John Harpson and, and Stylian Petrov, for example, yeah. who are who are very good at the media, but they, they speak about Celtic in, in the way that former players should, but they're also very subjective and do their job well. But then Andy seems to have went down the other route, the kind of <laughs> the Celtic Chris Boyd. I don't know if that's a bit strong, but what, what, why is why do you think former players get in? Charlie Nick as well. Charlie, I would, I would, David, I David Proven. David Proven, I Proven think. Proven as well, aye. And, and the thing is, Del, right, um, and again, I'm no, no name drop. I've only spoken to these people because I've been working on projects that involved aye. interviews and I have spoken to all, all three of the guys. <laughs> Never spoke to Chris Commons. Um, Mark Wilson gets a hard time. Spoke to him loads of times. And, you know, Charlie Nicholas, David Proven and, and Andy Walker. Now, we all know David Proven was never a Celtic fan when he signed for Celtic, right? Yeah. Um, but Andy Walker and Charlie Nicholas definitely were. I remember getting Charlie's mobile number. I'm not giving away trade secrets because, I mean, you, you couldn't figure it out for this. I got Charlie Nicholas's number for an interview. And the last four digits of the mobile number were 1888. That's no <laughs> lies. And I, I'm, to this day, I'm not quite sure how he managed it. Um, and strangely enough, when I phoned him, he spoke to me in Spanish. Don't know what that was about, Dale. Never quite figured that out. <laughs> but <laughs> the other one, Andy Walker, I remember speaking to him, and he comes from, he's got like loads of brothers and sisters, and they're all mad Celtic fans. And he talks about going to the 1975 Scottish Cup final against Airdrie, Big Billy's last game. Big Billy then signs him for Celtic. Dream come true. Speaks about his time, you know, under. Billy McNeil particularly in glowing terms, it was his, it was his ambition. I think there's a few different elements. Um, the minute you have an opinion about Celtic, as I've probably seen a wee bit uh, on Axon, that doesn't go with the flow, then you're going to be uh, criticised. Uh, but 
it goes a bit deeper, I think, once you're in the mainstream, because there is definitely narratives and there's agendas, 100%. I mean, we've seen it time and time again. The, the most recent one, the golds in handball. It's uh, like, right, let's shut up shop, bring down the shutters, we're not talking about it, you know. And it's almost as if you can't have an opinion um, about anything without the agenda coming into place. And I think uh, that comes into play a lot of the times. And I know that in that bad season, whether or not we talk about it, I don't know, um, where everything just felt a bit, and we're all stuck in the house in Dubai and all this. I remember Neil Lennon. I don't know if you've ever seen this interview, Del. And it was a Sky Sports interview. And he just he goes off on one, doesn't he? And uh, I, yeah. And it was Andy Walker was his target, you know. And I'm not sure if that was televised or if it was live, but I've definitely got the file. <laughs> I've I've seen the interview, and he goes he goes really uh, he goes studs up for Andy. And so I wouldn't doubt that these guys are Celtic fans. I'll say David Proven was never a Celtic fan prior to signing for the club. Um, but, I mean, some of the stuff I read and some of the stuff I hear, you think to yourself they're falling into um, line with, with maybe the, the, the kind of thought process of people around them, producers of shows. Um, uh, what what happens if you, you go against the grain? Del, do you still have a job? I'm not sure. I know. That's, that's the thing then, but that's the, you're selling yourself to the devil then, aren't you? I mean... Hmm. I mean, I mean, would, would, would you personally go on and if you were told you were doing something in regards to, to Celtic and they tell you, if we ask you such and such a question, don't say this? Well, Or, or if you're on live TV and you're commentating, I mean, you, you look at the likes of Chris Boyd, there's, there's absolutely no way in the world Sky Sports are telling him to say the stuff he's saying. So that's why, as you say, you wonder why a guy who's grew up a massive Celtic fan comes across as... A bit of a prick, you know what I mean? See, see, I wonder why. I've seen a tiny, tiny wee bit of it, a tiny element of it, right? I remember, like you were saying before, um, getting asked to do this, and I, and I understand why people think, all right, you're you're sticking the boot in, they didn't talk to you when things are going well, but that isn't accurate, right? Because, uh -huh. you know, I've been asked as many times to do it when we're winning um, doubles under Ange Postacoglu as I did before, but I can understand. Nobody wants us to slag off Celtic, absolutely not. And I try my best to be as balanced as possible. But I do remember, and a bit, I'm not naming any names, but I do remember turning up one day and the voice in my ear was a completely different idea from what I had. It was a different view. It was a different opinion. And I wasn't going to go down that, that road. This was in the preamble before anything starts running. I says, that's not my opinion at all. And I gave my opinion, which was probably quite controversial at the time anyway, but it turned out to be uh, right because I said, we need a change. We need a change at managerial level. It's October and things are slipping away that early. And people think that's a knee-jerk reaction, but that was the us losing 10 in a row. So right. I, I think it is at play. I just think what happens is people use the word narrative. It's like a culture. It's like you go into any kind of office and if the culture is this or the opinion is that, you know, sometimes it can be difficult for the one person to say, actually, I completely disagree with everybody in this room. And I, uh, think, that, I think there's a big issue with that, you know. So it takes a bit of bravery. Or indeed, um, it takes yourself or other people to do their own thing, set up their own platforms, have their say that way. Yeah, definitely. I, I think the, the sheep and the wool thing comes in. Yeah, as you say, if you're in that environment, but I think you just expect guys that have been there and, and played with the club and supported the club that they'd be a wee bit more kind. But listen, let, let's let's move on. Let's move on. Um you mentioned when you when you went in the supporters buses, it was home and away. Mm -hmm. And obviously back in the days, the well, probably some of the stadiums are still the same. And and I and I've always spoke about Fur Hill mm -hmm. and Den, Dens Park, and I've been to Capolo. What what's your memories? Of obviously the jungle and that is we'll we'll, we'll get to that. But uh, yeah, yeah. What what's what's your kind of memories of your 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 worst away grounds in Scotland? And there was some absolute horrors, by the way. That, that... They're terrible, some of them, you know. And like you say, a lot of them, it's like going back in time. <laughs> um, I remember, you mentioned for how I remember the game we played there against Stirling Albion. It was at a neutral ground because we couldn't play at their ground. And we are wearing that fantastic away strip, which we've replicated this year. But it was the oh, original aye. 1990s version. Aye, brilliant. Aye, aye. I remember Pat McGinley scored an absolute belter at the game behind the goals. I thought it was like Marco Van Basten's against Russia. The 1988 European Championship Finals. It was nothing like that, but you know, in, in my mind's eye at that time, 
Did he score about 17 that year, McGinley? I loved McGinley. I, oh, I, what, a, what a player. I think he got a raw deal. It, you know, it was clear that a new manager came in and he wanted to sign Phil O'Donnell and all this and, you know, we had to bring in some money. But I I, I thought McGinley was a, a decent, a right decent player for Celtic. Um, but I always remember sitting there and I would notice daft things. Maybe I was a, a, a weird kid or a, a bit of a geek. But I remember looking at the size of the floodlights. There were new floodlights there. And you right. could barely see past them. They were that thick, you know, because the stadiums were just... If something needed done, it would get tacked on, you know. And Celtic Park was like that as well. Once we get to the jungle, you know, there's a lot of romanticism about the jungle, but by God, you know, there's some experiences in there. And But the worst experience I ever had, I mean, Tyne Castle as well, behind the goals at Tyne Castle. Um, and I remember just daft wee things like my old man going to get pies and bovrols and that and, you know, squeezing the pie. And there was more liquid in the pie than there was in the cup of bovrol. It's just, <laughs> you know, the things you were doing was was just bizarre. You know, and but there was one occasion I remember at Fur Park, and it was a nothing each game. It was absolutely rotten, um, and we're behind the goals, right? And I remember after the game, deal, my feet never touched the ground, right? It was that there was too many fans in there. It was it was terracing. My feet never touched the ground, and it was scary. Now this was, I think it was nineteen ninety. I think it was post Hillsborough, and I remember coming home, speaking to my old fella. And he was like, aye, that, that was pretty bad today, but it was nothing like uh, the city ground. My old man was at the Nottingham Forest game oh, right. in Nottingham, 1983. He says that was the worst he had experienced. But the stadiums were absolutely unfit for purpose. And, you know, they would just completely ram you in there. There was no thought for safety. Um, and I know that with the modern game, there's been a lot of things that the game's lost that we look back on and, and you know, we, we kind of like a, a hazy glow and think, oh, they, they were great days. But the football stadiums, you know, by and large, were really, really poor and they weren't safe a lot of the time. No, they certainly weren't. And even talking about that, you can relate that to the jungle. I remember being in there as a kid and talking about going to the games and supporters buses and that. And I, I, I never went to the game with my dad. I just get put in the supporters bus at <laughs> 10, 11, 12 year old, but to the own. Yeah. My, my boy's 11 now and he's asking and I'm like, absolutely no chance on earth. It's, the, the, the days have changed so much, but remember the jungle talking about the, the old stadiums getting lifted down the turnstile? The absolute stench of piss. I know. The beer. Know. And and sometimes staying after the game and it was just floods and floods and floods of cans and half mm-hmm. bottles of whiskey. And I used to go down and stand at the front at maybe eight-year-old and no see whoever was, I was with for the full 90 minutes, but the memories are absolutely fantastic. They are. But they you are. just never, ever, ever get away with what happened back then <laughs> nowadays. But the, 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 jungle, the jungle was a, a, is a fantastic memory. I've got to Celtic. I loved it. What an experience. They, they not, not, never went a lot, but absolutely loved it. <laughs> I remember all the things you mentioned, like I say, I, I do remember smells and colours and all that, and it was, you see coming through as well, people might not really realise this if you're a local uh, to Celtic Park and Parkhead as an area, but even just, I remember like, you know, the guys walking about with the macaroon bars and shouting Aye. Wrigley Spearmint macaroons and, and the Glaswegian accent. And you're a wee uh, five, five guy going, what is this? You know what I mean? <laughs> and then like, I remember seeing a grown man just, Dana Piss where he was standing and Aye. everything just flowing down and it was like but I also remember um, particularly one game, it was a New Year's Day game against Rangers and I'm going to say 91, I'd need to check the wiki, I think it was 91 um, Charlie Nicholas was on the front of the cover of the programme Del, I always remember who was on the programme so that's how sad it was, Charlie Nicholas in his second spell, so he was on that and Tony Mowbray scored for Celtic, he scored the equaliser um, but they beat us 3-1 eventually. And it was absolutely hosing it down with rain. If you watch the game on YouTube or that, it's just that it was a horrible day. But I remember once we got into the stadium and once we got into the jungle, the feeling, the comfort, the body heat around about you because I was freezing oh, and wet right. and you know what I mean? And then getting into the jungle and it was just like everybody, it was just, so it actually gave you that and you could then see the steam coming off everybody as they were starting to dry out a wee bit. Um, but I loved the jungle and then I remember... Um, going to a gig at Celtic Park in 1993 and we waited and waited and waited we're right at the front me and my mate Charlie Hutton from High Valley Field and once we got into the stadium Celtic Park it was a uh, U2 gig we ran so we could get to the front there I was still quite young at the time 
Um, but I remember we were in there and loads of people hadn't bothered doing that. Um, 92 New Year game, there you go, 3 1. I think it was John Brown that scored the third goal for Rangers. Um, and I looked over to the jungle, Dill, because they had put the seats in by then. And I'm on the pitch, obviously, for the oh, gig. I... And I just, it just never looked right when they put the seats in the I... jungle, you know. It was just, I... it was the, the end of an era, mate. It was, it was, but the memories, the memories are there and they always will be there. And I, I love, I love speaking to kind of the older generation, like my dad and that, who are in their sixties and seventies about the stories. I'm, I'm, ha I'm actually hoping to get my dad on because he kind of stopped going to the games in the eighties because he was running the boys' club stuff and that. But his stories for the kind of sixties through to the eighties are, are, are phenomenal. It'd be, it'd be a really good lesson. Um, home, home games. Well, we're on, on the point then and. And, and European nights and, and derby games uh, it, it's very hard to pick one but European games under the rights at Paradise are, are the best in the world for me the best atmosphere in European football I, I don't buy into all the, the people putting oh this player said this and this player said that it, it's just the best it's the best under the lights the, the games I've been to for the, for the 90s it's so so hard to pick um, especially kind of through the Martin O'Neill era, but what what European nights do you kind of fondly remember most at, at Paradise? Well, I've written down a few because I'm going to go for O'Neill, Strachan and Lennon, different eras, right. because both you know those three managers in my lifetime um, had some right good European results. Yeah. I mean, right up to O'Neill, what was European football? As a Celtic fan, you know, growing up no. in the 80s, um, did you know we very rarely got beyond kind of late 80s? We very late, uh, rarely got beyond the first couple of rounds. I know that there was a couple of um, there was a couple of seasons, a couple of campaigns like the Davy Hay campaign when you know Rapid Vienna put us out, they ended up getting to the final. And uh, Davy Hay reckons we could have got to the final if that whole furore hadn't kicked off uh, again to the 90s. And, and I remember very, very few good results in the 90s. Um, Cologne. I, can, I can always remember the Cologne game for some Cologne. reason and Partizan, Partizan Belgrade. We got beat, but you know, we won the game on the night, uh, but we got beat on, on the you know, over the two beat, ties. Did we beat Cologne 3 0 at him? 3 0. Aye, aye. Um, I remember aye. the away the away game was live on one of the uh, German satellite TV channel, I think it was RTL or something, right? So the, the away right. game was live and they beat us 2 0, and they beat us convincingly. And for us to then take them back to Celtic Park and beat them 3 0. You start wondering what what's the stadium, what's the atmosphere, what's the fans got to do with us because they were such a better team than us in the first leg. So if I'm looking at O'Neill's time, and I know people might be surprised because I've left it the Seville run. I'm just looking for a one-off game. Aye, aye. And the game, the game I would choose is Juventus four three. Oh yes, um, love, and I, love unbelievable, that. unbelievable. And and Chris Sutton, and I just you know I remember and my old man never denies this, but I remember when we signed him, and. Uh, I, well, I'll go back a wee bit. I remember when we signed Tony Cascarino for a million quid, right? And it was yeah. on the news, and he was saying to me, oh, this guy's a dumpling. <coughs> he said the exact same about Chris Sutton when we signed Sutton. And okay. I always remind him of that, because Sutton is a legend. Eh? Um, and that was one of his finest performances in a Celtic jersey, of which there were many. But that, that was one game that sticks out for me under Martin O'Neill, without the Seville run, because that's almost like an island in itself. Aye, definitely. Um, Gordon Stratton, done so, so well in Europe, but the one game I would pick out would be AC Milan, 2-1. Uh, 2-1, was that it was, Scott uh, McDonald's McDonald. game? McDonald uh, scores a winner. Yeah. Uh, McManus scored the first goal. And Sweet. of course, Neil Lennon. Is that the game? Did I get a, a slap with one of the fans? Aye, he did. Aye. Game, aye. He, went, he went down <laughs> like a, aye, he'd been poleaxed. Um, and then Lenny, 11 years ago, Barcelona. You can't, I mean, everybody's going to say the same. And I know that in terms of a performance, and I've got the DVD and all that in this, because I'm still old school, it wasn't great to watch as a Celtic fan, oh, but you know yeah. what I mean? Uh, what a result. Unbelievable result. Uh, the atmosphere that night and the, the TIFO, I think, still the best I've ever been involved in, without a shadow of a doubt. Unbelievable. Um, the, 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 was it the 150 that night, was it? 125. 125. I thought it was 125. Aye, the TIFO and that was un unbelievable. And I, I, I've been to away games and we'll get to your away, your away trips, but going to Europe and, and being in being to Paris and stuff like that, and the, the the only thing it looks as if it would ever come close, and it's it's definitely 
hundred percent on a bucket list is um, the Argentinian derby or the the Boca Juniors River Plate or the Galatasaray Fenerbahce. Yeah, that that that's the two I would like to go to. But if have you been anywhere else outside Scotland and and, and been in such a, an intense atmosphere that you think that comes close? Well, probably no, mate. Um, <clears throat> I used to, I, I've, I've done quite a, a few bits of England, I've done quite a lot of stadiums in England. I, I'm not a massive fan of English football now, but back in the day, I would go to Newcastle games, uh, being to Anfield, Old Trafford, and a lot of the time, I enjoyed back in the day where there was a testimonial doing South as well. Aye. And that's yeah. maybe because that probably coincided a lot of the time where us no really having European um, endeavours and adventures and so you would enjoy the, the away days that way you know you, you maybe get Man United and the Brian Robson testimonial Ian Ross testimonial at Anfield and they were big deals they were like really right. special occasions and it was always about I guess putting your uh, putting your colours to the mast so that when you came away they would, they would say what was that what just came to Highbury what just came uh-huh. to Anfield and that used to happen all the time they did um, as well at the time Unbelievable. But, but I think what happened is it got to the point where everybody was asking Celtic to play testimonials. Aye, yeah. And I, I was big into my fanzines back in the day. And I remember the, the one that really kind of stopped all that was probably Graham, Graham Sharp at uh, Everton. Aye. So we played Everton a few times. We played Neville Southall testimonial was at e- uh, Everton. But Graham Sharp was mooted to be playing Celtic. And people pointed out, you know, that's just a payday for him because he's a Rangers fan. So why there was, there was no affiliation to Celtic? Why would we go down there and the numbers? And I remember people being really vocal. If there was one thing about not the view back in the day, they were ahead of the curve there. If they had an, opi- an opinion on something, generally speaking, people would catch up with them. They were talking about um, you know going going public and, and building a, an all seater stadium and getting rid of the board in 1987. It didn't happen until 1993. They were always ahead of the curve. But I, I do remember they were very vocal about Sharp. And it's something that's kind of been lost because modern football, you don't really get many players that, that play for 10, 12 years at one club. But a lot of their games, I thought, were really, really special. But I did enjoy St. James's Park. And I think it was... I was, because... there, I was there a few a few weeks ago, just before Christmas. But unfortunately... I like, I like the fans, Del. I just like the fans. I love their enthusiasm. And um, I went a lot. I did go to a lot of games down there. And I just... I'm not going to say that there were some lot of Celtic fans, right? Yeah. Um, but I did feel that there was a, a real, you know, passion. And I see the yeah. same, I could feel the same passion at Liverpool. But I, I didn't go to Liverpool, you know, modern day. I, I went in the 80s and 90s, uh, late 80s and the early 90s. And I felt a passion down there. Uh, maybe similar to what we we feel at Celtic. But Newcastle definitely got that as well, Tim. I, I unfortunately picked a a nil nil game against Bournemouth and it was terrible. And it was also um when Al Wizzy just passed away, so it was the full um the full so, Union Jack Serenade and um the I, I spent I spent quite a bit of time in the toilet hiding. <laughs> but, I thought you were saying I thought you were going to say paying your respects there, Bill. No, no, hiding at the start <laughs> of the game and whatever other minutes it was there. But I Newcastle, one city club, that's the third or fourth time I've been there. I mean that place is on fire. It's on fire. The the, the noise is very similar. The kind of Scottish roar that you hear at, at Paradise that you don't really hear anywhere else in the world. Um, it's, it's totally different. By the the Geordies are a good bunch. The Geordies and the Scousers. I think I think they possibly join us if um, if we and a gets independence. They might be um, they might be under the under the salt tire. It. They'd be up. Uh, it's, it's a shame. It's a shame. Football with regards to Newcastle anyway. Where the ownership and the dirty money comes into it because ah, no, the, I, I've got to separate the fan base from that. You know, it's a fan yeah, base I'm talking about, and it's the club that I'm talking about rather than just these custodians that come in with their their dough. Um, but I, I've not been for a wee while. I think maybe one of the games. Some, JP was talking the day about um, he can't remember being interviewed at Seville because he'd had a few share bits, right? right. But there, there was an STV crew, and apparently he was interviewed, and his mates keep telling him about this. But we were interviewed one time at St. James's and it was the um, the four each game with Arsenal. All right. So a couple of, a couple of my mates um, are actual fans in Newcastle. I, I was never that a fan. Was that Keegan time, though? He was in charge of uh, Newcastle. 
because Joey Barton was I'm, playing I'm, that day. I'm probably thinking back to the kind of. Oh, I that was the, the Newcastle I'm, I'm, Liverpool game. I, I, yeah, I fourth three game. Kind of, the kind of Stan Collymore time and that there was a few crackers. Ah, that was, that was unbelievable. Other. Unbelievable. When was in charge, die. This was a game, Dale, where Newcastle were four 0 down at half time, and I, um, there was a protest, and, and loads of fans were leaving, leaving the stadium. And because my two mates were Newcastle fans, are like, right, we're leaving. And I was like, I'm, I'm here to watch the game. So anyway, uh, I left with them. And we ended up in a boozer across for the stadium called the Strawberry. And aye, aye. We seen the goals. We never saw the, the footage, but we seen the goals coming on the Sky Sports. It was four one, four two, one of the greatest comebacks in Premiership history. And we missed the second half. But the interview does on our way at the stadium. I don't know where that footage is. Um, hopefully, we never see it again. Aye, I think most of the boys and my supporters bus have not seen a second half yet. They're, they're in their forties. <laughs> the London Road Taverns. Their, their season ticket. Um, Brilliant. The the formerly known as the Old Firm and now now the Glasgow Derby. Again, very very hard to pick. We're we're kind of a, a, a similar age as well, so the, the 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 obvious games always always pop up. But what's been your favourite either Paradise or or over at the the other place across the water, mate? The, you see that there was a period there where we were giving them a scalping every time we played them. And oh. um, that was all brilliant, and that was that was great. But there there are certain games that stand out that weren't part of that run for me. And sometimes it was getting a result that was probably your only highlight, you know. And that happened quite a lot in the nineties. But I was having a look through some of the games, um, and I remember a game at Celtic Park where we beat them three nothing. It was back in twenty eleven, right? Um, and there was a moment after oh, that Gary Hooper comments. Yes. That was yeah. the game, I and and we yeah. absolutely destroyed them that day, Dell. And there was just this moment where later on, Brendan Rogers spoke about a holy trinity where everything comes together, the fans, the players, the management. And I felt it did that day in the stadium. The atmosphere was unbelievable. Uh, let's all do the Bruni and all that. That that was that day, and we uh, absolutely battered them. So you know, I know that sometimes games in your mind aren't as pivotal but that that was one that I loved the atmosphere was just tremendous and I was at that game it was brilliant yeah and, and unfortunately we went to Fort Park the following week and they beat us remember that the long ball bounced over Mulgrew Motherwell beat us um, right, aye. and it almost renders the, the win obsolete but that that's the game that stood out and then I remember the game when Joe Ledley scored the winner being at that game as well um, the one nil game, and there was just a feeling at that time that everything was going to change, and that not just with us, you know, we knew what the situation was with Rangers at that point. There, we knew that you know winning the league and all that would be catastrophic for them, um, and we beat them one nothing. And I loved the game, but I always think about uh, Kyle when I think about that game because I loved him. I thought he was tremendous. I could be playing. That was the night McCulloch done him, he broke his That's ankle. Right. Aye. Yep. Never the same player after it. Um, and I'm going to throw in a third one that I really, really loved, and that was just in February last year, the 3 0 game. Um, it was I got I gave I gave my tickets away that night for some crazy reason, and I still get reminded of it. Oh, and it was the paddy, it was the paddy for the jungle jams. I had a good reason. I, I was I was off work with the with the COVID, so I, I just know so many people and I thought. I can't be half up with COVID and then go and sit at the game and see my gaffer or or see somebody. But I was sitting watching it in the house knowing that Paddy and that was in my seat was just horrendous. And it, it looked like oh. one of the best the best derby atmospheres of all time without, without any of them being there. It was unbelievable. Um, and you know, there's been this argument about the allocation. You mentioned some of the biggest derbies in the world and I start wondering if in time with the allocation um, being cut, if the the impact of our derby will be lesser. I think it, in time it probably will be, to be fair. But um, on the other hand, at Celtic Park that night, there was a special, special atmosphere. You know, just Celtic fans. Um, the only frustration, the only downside is we probably should have beat them 6 nothing. And, and, you know, going back to some of the games when we went on that run and we were beating them 5-1 and all that, there was a few of the games where we should have beat, we really should have put them to the sword. Um, you know, five goals up after 50 minutes and stuff like that. We should have beat them seven, eight, nine, one. Um, and we didn't. 
that was my only regret about the three nothing game. But it was just it was just everything coming together again. We had supposed to call the new Japanese signings. We didn't we hadn't really seen them and you yeah. know flourish until that night. It was just it was just tremendous. I loved it. It was it was mate. But t- touching on Ange before we move on to the the big eleven, the the hardest question for a Celtic fan. But I again, mate, obviously. The, the business has been done very, very early, but before the January transfer windows even open. Mm-hmm. There's obviously talks today in regards to Jack Amakis going to Sampdoria. Juranovic mm-hmm. looks as if he's going to be going to be at the door, but on on the rest of the season, mate, before we move on, confident on not only the league, but a, a possible treble in the bag. And the ads revolution keeps on rolling, mate. The, the, the squad at the moment, I think we spoke about it last week, the first team squad's 42, 43 players. Um, what, what what are you looking at in January and, and, and where we're going to be at the end of the season? A, a, a hopefully, a better push at European football. Without a doubt, I think, see, when you look at last season, Dale, right, we should, probably shouldn't have won a double. I, I was never... <coughs> going to concede defeat with the league and I remember when we were doing kind of early season shows last season Kevin Graham was saying to me if we're still in touch and distance by Christmas and I'm thinking that's not good enough we need to win the league we Aye. need to win this league yeah. um, so for him to do that for Ange to do that was unbelievable and in time we probably realise it now but in time it will become even more of an achievement but then this season it's just all about uh, strengthening that and the signings that he's bringing in and the business that we're doing and we're doing it early I know there's going to be a, a wee bit more movement between now and the end of January, shows that there's a level of control there that maybe that, some previous managers hasn't had. That's, that's a good thing. That's, that's a good massive. It's huge, yeah. you know. Um, but it, it, there was a really interesting interview was sp- speaking about expectations of a Celtic manager. He goes, it's not in a job description, but you're expected to win a treble every season. You're expected to win everything. Um, and the way we're playing so far, you know, very, very few hiccups, very, very few complaints. It would need to be a a set of circumstances, Dale, where everything went wrong for uh, us to, to, you know, not win, for example, on Saturday. And that's not me being overconfident. It's just that's the way we're playing. And uh, even if there's an injury, we bring somebody else in. We put Alistair Johnson making his debut at Ibrox. Brilliant. I thought he was. I thought he was our best player. Super. It was brilliant, and you know that's what Ange can do. Is we're now buying players to fit a system, rather than buying a player who looks good or is highly rated or whatever. But Aye. what a lot of the previous signings have shown us is Shane Duffy would never have fitted that system. Albin Ayeti would never have fitted the system, but we bought them anyway. We brought them in anyway. Um, Ange is very specific in his needs. A lot of it is data driven, uh, and then obviously he then speaks to the player, makes sure the player's not going to be bad for the dressing room. And he brings them in. I'm a bit disappointed with Yakamakis because I don't think we've seen the best of him, Dale. I love the big man. I love Aye. him, mate. Disappointed as well. And the, we, we spoke about it the other night. And, and again, speaking about Ange, sometimes you say something wrong about a Celtic player or, or, or Ange because he's he's he's, a, he's the god that now that people jump down your throat and say you can't say that. Of course you can. Of course you can. You've got an opinion. Mm-hmm. If, if we never had opinions, we wouldn't be sitting here talking to each other. So... I think he's probably been mismanaged, mate. I, I really do. I think there's been so many opportunities that we could have given him more minutes. And I know Kyogo is a top goal scorer. He, he, he's played well now. And, and, and he's now playing in a position that he stays in the box and he's netting goals, which you want for your number nine. Mm-hmm. But having two strikers, I mean, if they bring Cho in, what's going to be the, the, the massive difference for him, for Jack Amakis, if he's consistently just going to be playing Kyogo all the time is that going to put signings off as well when, when they look at the team and and, and Angie's always said he's got a big enough squad to rotate which he hasn't really done by the way he hasn't really done it I, I look at remember the interview Yakamakis gave last season um, and he was so so you know he had such a self-belief deal right people were saying it was arrogance I didn't think it was arrogance I thought the confidence he had was unbelievable it was like we've got the best squad and he just had yeah. this belief that we were going to win the league. Now, if that's part of his character, and it would appear that it is when he's getting interviewed and stuff like that, then he's not going to be happy with 12 minutes, Dale. He's, you know, no. at his stage, his no. career, he's not going to be happy with 12 minutes. He's got an international career. 
Um, there's talk about, oh, there was promises made. I'm not too sure how much I would make of that because, you I know, this isn't... Is... Andrew's the type of guy to make guys promises. No no yeah. chance. It doesn't come across that way at all, man. No, and where are we? I mean, I remember the Canio threw the toys at the pram because there were promises. Van Hooydonk was the same. The game's moved on. Anything that's been promised is in black and white. It's part of the contract. You know, there's no gentleman's agreement here. Um, and, you know, then the rumours start and all this kind of stuff. If he leaves, and it looks as though we're already lining up his replacement, I will be pretty disappointed. I think so if he was getting more minutes, you know, 30 games in a season, what kind of damage he could do? We'll never know. We won't, we won't as disappointing. One of the boys said in the podcast on Monday, I was knowing it, but if he had the minutes, Kai Ogle had, and the chances that he had conversion rate, he reckons Jack and Marcus would have more goals and I tend to agree. I tend to agree, mate. But it's been a good window. I'm excited, mate. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if we, I think if we win on Saturday, the, the, the treble won't be far away. I would love to see him left in the treble this year. It would be, it would be absolutely phenomenal. Then, hopefully, hold on to him as much as my second loves Everton. They better keep their trap shut and stay away. Absolutely. Um, every every, because, every job now, every job oh, is going to be linked with, with them all. Every one of them, you know. Said. Right, mate, we'll move on. Um, end of the show. Best of living and manager. Um, very, very hard pick. Just it one is. before just one before we do move on. What's, what's been your favourite season, supporting Celtic? It's always the centenary season. Is it? I, always, I always go back to that, no matter what. And I think it's because that's when I started going to the games, Dale. And then this thing, this thing called Celtic, it became even more real than, you know, my family... If you can imagine, like the new year, with regards to um, the family coming together, the songs, the bevy, all that it was all Celtic. Everything was centered around Celtic, deal, Celtic songs, Irish songs, all that kind of stuff. And then finally yeah. going to the game. So it would have been an amazing experience in memory, anyway. But then we win the double, so it just made it even better. And I was, fucking, yeah. I was in love with that team: McAvaney, McStay. Big Roy, Tommy Burns, Billy Stark. What a side. Loved that. Aye. That was my favourite season. Best strap as well. That in the 85. Brilliant. Superb yes, strap. Yes, 100%. Right, mate. Best of living. Um, your formation, your gig, your players, mate. Let's go. Wow. I mean, I've got to go for four three three simply because there's certain players I can't leave out, you know. Cool. Um, and goals. You know, for the first massive part of my Celtic support in life, Pat Bonner was the goalie. But he's not my favourite goalkeeper. Um, nah. I've probably seen him playing better for Ireland than he did for Celtic. Definitely. But I'm going to go for big Foster. Foster. Right. Um, I love Boruch. I love the, the carry on. I loved all that. You know, he was a cult hero. But in terms of quality, I, I thought Foster brought something. If we'd got Foster in the, the season we were going for a 10, we'd have been looking at a different campaign. For Aye. sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, but he, he's my goalkeeper. Uh, and I remember when I'm trying to remember who we were playing. I was at the game the night it was announced he was coming back on loan. It was Sion. Remember we, oh, we, got, knocked, we got knocked out yeah. and there was a registration issue and all that. Is that Gattuso's team? Is that who was that, in charge? No, ah, it could have been. He, he, he was the manager at one point. Yeah. Is that the Swiss team, aye? The Swiss team, mate. And um, uh, they knocked us out, but they messed up the paperwork. And it was on that night, I remember that it was Chad Uri sold the jerseys that night. Remember him? Um Oof. And I remember hearing that Foster was coming back for his second spell, and nobody was that overwhelmed by it, you know. But he became he became an absolute giant. Now, I was speaking about this today, bizarrely enough. My two centre halves, because what JP and I were talking about is how close is Carter Vickers to your best team? He's getting there. He's getting there. But my two centre halves are Virgil van Dijk and right. Paul, Paul Elliott. Big Elliott. Now, he was only at at the club for two seasons, right? He oh, played in the nineties, but what a player! Unbelievable. Unbelievable. We one one of the boys at the end of the show, Hoggy does a week kind of final thoughts at the end of a Monday, and that's what he asked: Is is Virgil Van Dijk a better defender? Uh, Cameron Carter Vickers a better defender than Virgil Van Dijk, and has he been a more successful player or a more kind of prominent player and most of the panel kind of mm-hmm. say die which is strange to say because if Van Dyke's an absolute Rolls Royce but I just think Vickers is 
if we keep him beyond the summer, I will be absolutely amazed. The guy is absolutely out of this world. He's Can imagine the... him, Carter Vickers and Paul Elliott playing in, oh. in the one defence as well. I wouldn't fancy that, mate. The, the, the thing with Carter Vickers, in terms of his defensive ability, I can see the argument. I really can. Van Dyke, did he have a great performance for Celtic in Europe? Not quite sure he did. Carter uh, Vickers, I want to see Carter Vickers having a full campaign in Europe next year, and then we can we can talk about that argument because then I, have, I think a lot of people will agree if he shows yeah. up well in Europe. Paul Elliott, for me, was just the best tackler I've ever seen, and he probably should have been the captain um, because at the time, McStay, who makes my midfield, by the way, he was a captain, but I don't think... I, I think it weighed quite heavy on his shoulders. Now, yeah. my, my full-backs... It's all about their capabilities going forward as well, right? So you might be surprised with the right back. I've got Kieran Tierney at left back. Uh, still love Kieran Tierney. I'd love to see him coming back at some point. I don't still care. Time, yeah. I don't care if he's thirty six and he comes back for a season. I'd love to see him coming back. Um, and my right back is Tom Boyd. Now, Tommy Boyd, good shout, mate. He's, Tom he's Boyd. actually he's actually been in. He's been in a few a few of my teams when I've done this. To be honest. He could play centre half, he could play left back. I've put him at the right the right hand side, and I think it's because of my memories of the stop in the 10 season. Um, him going down that wing. I love Wee Jackie. I thought Wee Jackie was brilliant um as well. But I'm going to put Tommy Boyd so that him and Tierney can bomb down the wings because everybody else is basically playing through the centre, I'm afraid, right? So I'm a tactical <laughs> genius, right? <laughs> my midfield's made up of Paul McStay the Maestro, um, Stan Petrov. And then I was thinking to myself, do I put Wan Yama in there just for a bit of, you know, height and weight? But I loved John Collins still. I loved Collins Johnny as a Celtic Collins, player. So Johnny Collins is in there, right? He was class. And I would have loved to see him in a successful side. And then my three up top, even though one of them can do what he wants, he could just wander about. I'm going to start with Maravchik. He's your kind of number 10. He can do what he likes, right? right. Um, Larson and Dembele up top. Dem Belly, I had in mind, mate. And, uh, and uh, tended to go along the lines of Larson and Sutton, Larson and Hartson because it was kind of interviewing people of the same age. But Dem Belly was in mind as well, mate. I loved him. I did. loved him. And, and that's age, another player. Hope he comes back. The age of him, you know. So I'm, I'm like I said, I loved Big Hartson and I loved Sutton as well. And that, that was one of the best periods as, as my Celtic support in life was, was Martin O'Neill's team. So Martin O'Neill was my manager. Now, the only reason it's no Tommy is because we didn't win the league under Tommy Burns, but I loved his team. He didn't have a goalie. If he had a goalkeeper, we would have won the league. So Tommy Burns is his assistant, but Martin O'Neill was a manager. Good man, good man. Good team, mate. And uh, it's a good job you've got a good defence, mate, because that's just an all-out attack. It is. So it's I said 4 3 3, but God knows. We, we, we would certainly score a lot of goals. Um, we would, mate. We would. I'd, lo I'd love to see some of them back. Like you say, Tierney. I'd love to see Tierney back, then Belly. And at some point in the future, Paul McStay should be at the club. You know, or um, he, he could be an Australian ambassador because he's based over there. That's it, mate. I dare say he's got an eye for a bit of talent. So, in, in the footballing sense, I don't know why I say that in case his wife's listening. <laughs> but listen, mate. That's been a good um, 10 minutes. I've I've thoroughly enjoyed it and I really Loved appreciate it, your time. Thanks to everybody listening. Um, the boys will be back tomorrow night for the Friday live show. Um, I'm away at the Top Golf tomorrow, mate, to get a bash. So have a good night, troops. Take care and God bless. And uh, I'll catch up with you next Monday. Nice one. All the best, Dale.